Hello you guys, welcome back to the vlog. If you are new here, my name is April. I am a nurse practitioner and I have been an NP for about a year and a half now. I have worked in primary care for the last year and a little bit before that I worked in GI. Um, but I do a lot of lifestyle videos on TikTok, um, just about my life as an NP, my life outside of being an NP, but I also am trying to do some more educational videos. I have done a lot of educational videos on TikTok and they were very helpful, people wanted more. But obviously when you are talking about diagnosing and treating certain conditions, there is so much that plays a role in that and so much talking and just there's a lot <laughs> just there's a lot if i'm being honest and i just felt like i couldn't really say everything i needed to say on tiktok so i decided to create a series here on youtube about how i diagnose and treat certain conditions so i have covered one topic previously which is hypertension which is my personal favorite condition to treat but i am now going to cover diabetes and if you know anything about diabetes, you know that it is an extremely difficult condition to treat um, and it is on the rise and it is a very serious condition. So this is going to be a big lesson today. Um, take notes, take breaks if you need them. Um, and then obviously reference your own textbooks, reference your own peers, your, super, your medical supervisor, other NPs, because it's not a one size fits all for diabetes. It's very much treating the patient and being very patient specific, which is of course with every disease process. This is going to be a basic overview of how to diagnose the medications that are available for us to treat, when to start certain medications, what your goal should be with certain medications and when to follow up on them. So let's get into it. So obviously when we are talking about diagnosing diabetes, there are two main types of diabetes. I mean, type one diabetes being an autoimmune diabetes that is typically diagnosed in childhood, but not always, and type two diabetes, which is what we're gonna be covering today, which is also called diabetes mellitus. Also, if I do not spell everything correctly, don't come at me, okay? I'm a practitioner. I'm not a professional speller. <laughs> Okay, so what is type 2 diabetes? Obviously, it's going to be most important to know what it is prior to treating it, but I will say this is not an anatomy lesson, so this is going to be a very brief overview of diabetes. So obviously, there are several different types of diabetes. We are talking about type 2 diabetes today, which is also known as diabetes mellitus. Diabetes mellitus is basically when the beta cells are not producing enough insulin, and the insulin is the key basically to bringing blood sugar to where it needs to go in the body. If you do not have enough insulin, then you have too much circulating blood sugar, which is where you get that high blood sugar from. Now, when you are diagnosing diabetes, you are going to diagnose it with a hemoglobin A1C of 6.5 or higher. That might vary a little bit based on what labs you're using, um, but typically it's 6.5. Pre-diabetes is thought to be an A1C of around 5.7 to 6.4. Now there are a lot of practitioners who will actually treat pre-diabetes with a very common diabetic medication, which is metformin. Um, and it is kind of going to be up to your clinical judgment when you use that. It is not necessarily guidelines. It's not necessarily indicated. Um, but if you have a patient with a lot of risk factors, then I would suggest starting metformin at this stage. And it's basically the only medication that's going to be approved by the insurance at this at this stage of the game. Unless you're also dealing with somebody who has heart disease, then you can think of medications like SGLT2s, which can be really good at this stage as well. They are technically diabetic medications, but we use them a lot in patients who have heart failure, cardiovascular disease, etc. and we will jump into those later. One of the biggest questions that I get asked is you get one blood sugar of 6.5 or higher and you all of a sudden diagnose the patient with diabetes and you start them on medications, and the answer is yes, 100%. Because if you are at that point, your blood sugar is already wreaking havoc on your body. Yes, for me at 6.5, this is not a discussion about, this is not only a discussion about lifestyle modifications, but we also have to start a medication. So I'm going to break up the medications into drug classes. And obviously the first line treatment for every condition Ever is lifestyle modifications okay especially when you reach the realm of diabetes now you have to monitor your carbohydrate intake a resource that I will give a lot to my patients is the American Diabetic Association 
um, or ADA.org because they have a lot of dietary plans. And if the insurance allows a lot of times, I will also refer to a nutritionist because they need to talk about how to eat because it's going to completely change their life. So that is obviously first line. But like I said, when your A1C is at 6.5 or higher, we also have to add on a medication to that first line treatment. So the first medication that we really always start in a patient with diabetes is going to be a biguanide and your biguanide is metformin, okay? <laughs> This is not my favorite medication to treat diabetes, but it is the insurance's favorite medication to treat diabetes. So like I said, usually this is where I will go if I have a pre-diabetic who has a lot of comorbidities, um, or if I have a 6.5 A1C and I feel like I just need one medication. It most of the time has to be this. Insurance will not cover um, say a GLP-1, a DPP-4, insulin, which you don't need insulin at this stage, but um, just know that I go to this because I have to. It's not necessarily my first choice. So when we're talking about medications, I like, I like to talk about the side effects a lot. S-E is going to be your side effect profile when it comes to my acronyms. Most common side effects of metformin are going to be nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. A lot of people also have like abdominal distension, abdominal pain, but diarrhea is definitely your biggest one. You do really need to watch out for B12 deficiencies because it will impair the patient's stomach's ability to absorb vitamin B12. So I always like to tell my patients who are on, met who are on metformin, add a B12 supplement to your life now. Now there are a few reasons why you would not go to metformin first off. One of the biggest reasons being that your kidney function is impaired severely. So meaning that you have a GFR of less than 30. Metformin can also help a little bit with decreasing the appetite and you do get a little bit of weight loss with it. So um, that's why it's often used for prediabetes as well. This kind of covers your first line. Next up, we're going to cover your GLP-1 agonists, which are going to be anything that ends in tide. So think exantide, semaglutide, trisepatide. Semaglutide and trisepatide are your, like your big ones on the market right now. Semaglutide is generic for Ozempic and trisepatide is generic for Monjaro. These are only type these are only FDA approved for type 2 diabetes, so I am not getting coverage on them for any other metabolic disorders like PCOS, metabolic syndrome, um, but I have seen some other people get that. Um, the only difference between semaglutide and terzepatide is going to be that terzepatide is not only a GL, it does not only work on your GLP-1, but it also works on your GIP. Um, so it works on two pancreatic receptors over one pancreatic receptor. Um, whereas like your exantide, your semaglutide, they work on one pancreatic receptor, which is the GLP-1. So basically these medications work by increasing insulin secretion. Your biggest side effects are going to be um, slowing down the digestive tract so that people feel fuller for longer. They tend to eat less and then it, it already helps them increase their insulin secretion. So you can get some gastroparesis, you can get some acid reflux, some abdominal bloating, um, increased acid production, nausea, vomiting, um, usually constipation, but some patients will get diarrhea and then big risk. And then a big thing is pancreatitis. So in my alcoholic patients, in my patients who um, have any type of history of pancreatitis, pancreatitis, whether it's idiopathic, whether it's caused by medications, alcohol, um, I would think twice before adding a GLP-1. And I would personally never use a GLP-1 if they have any personal or family history of medullary thyroid cancer. When they tested this medications on rats, they found that it could cause um, thyroid cancer. So when you are using a GLP-1, you can usually expect the A1C to decrease by about 1 to 1.5%. Say you diagnose somebody with diabetes at, say, an 8, and a hemoglobin A1C of 8. Really, goal for type 2 diabetes is going to be anywhere from less than 7 to 7.5%, depending on their other comorbidities and their age. But for me personally, if I can get a patient 
to a pre-diabetic range without dropping their blood sugar, that is what I'm going to do. So um, an A1C decrease of 1 to 1.5% 1 is great. The next drug class is DPP-4 inhibitors, which are very similar to your GLP-1s in that they also stimulate insulin secretion I, and they have a lot of similar side effect profile. Um, so when you're thinking of your GLP-1s, think that they end in tide, again, semaglutide, terzepatide. When you're thinking about your DPP-4 inhibitors, they are going to end in glyptin. So cytogliptin, saxagliptin, linagliptin, some brand names of them are um, Genuvia, Trigenta, um, but again, it's really helpful if you can break them down into what is their generic name. So really the same thing. They can decrease your blood sugar, really use them very cautiously in a patient who has a history of pancreatitis or if they, if the patient has any risk factors for pancreatitis, um, and then they can cause acute kidney injury. So just make sure that you are being careful with the prescribing of that but dpp4 is very similar to your glp1 our next drug class is going to be your sglt2 inhibitor and they are anything that ends in glyphosin okay um so canaglyphosin dapaglyphosin but your brand names are um that i feel like you guys will probably recognize are jardians farsiga and vocana these are prescribed a ton by cardiologists and nephrologists because the thing that I want you guys to remember most about these are they are really good for the kidneys and for the heart. Um, so you will not always see these in a diabetic patient, um, or you could see them in a patient who has cardiovascular disease or who has renal disease, who does not have diabetes, um, because they are really good for the heart and for the kidneys. But the way that they work is they basically block glucose reabsorption in the kidneys. I just erased my own notes. <laughs> So remember, whenever you're blocking reabsorption, that means that you are getting excretion. Um, so therefore, you're having more glucose being lost in the urine or being excreted in the urine. And they can decrease A1C by about 1.2%, which is, again, amazing. A lot of times, if you see these in diabetics, they are never um, the only medication that you see. And if they are the only medication that you see, I would hesitate to think that your patient is a diabetic. They might potentially be have cardiovascular disease or renal disease and not be diabetic, but you should check because those are both highly linked to diabetes. So our biggest side effect and what I want you to be concerned about is when you're prescribing these for female patients, because you get the sugar loss in the urine, it increases your risk for UTIs and yeast infections. Think fungus loves sugar. So yeast infections is a big, big deal, especially in your females. Um, but you can also get some decreased blood pressure, which again is great for our cardiovascular disease patients, but watch out for dehydration. So this is just a little reminder down here that I wrote that this is if you are treating a diabetic patient who has known heart disease or you see you notice that their GFR is decreased, you should start this medication on them. Okay, our next drug class and our last drug class that we are going to cover in depth is going to be sulfonylureas, which I like to think of as our old <laughs> diabetes drugs. These are very effective. Um, but they are mostly used by your older practitioner population because um, they've been out forever and they are relatively cheap. So if you have a patient who has fallen on a budget um, or insurance is not covering things well, I would highly suggest using one of these. However, because of the way that they work, you need to be very careful with what you use them in conjunction with. So your sulfonylureas are gonna be anything that end in eyed and they also always start with a G. Um, so glipizide, glyburide, glimperide, all of those ones. And they also work by increasing your insulin production. But the reason why I don't use these a ton is because they drop your blood sugar in an instant. So whenever I am using this, I always will tell my patients that they have to take it with food. Um, so this is not a medication that you take with your coffee in the morning and then you don't eat breakfast. This is a medication that you take with food. And they also do make extended release and immediate version. So obviously if you're using the extended release, you're not gonna get as big of a risk of the drop in blood sugar, but still always good to keep in the back of your mind. Um, so that's a huge patient education that you need to be teaching your patients and talk to and talking to them about if you are using one of these medications. Another reason I don't like to use these a lot is because of the side effect of weight gain. 
um, and they can increase your cardiovascular mortality risk. So um, they're good. They're very effective. They're just not my preferred agent. Everybody has their for preferred agent, but when I'm treating diabetes, um, I usually, I'm usually also treating obesity. So just not usually my go-to. Also because they are a sulfa drug, if a patient has a sulfa allergy to like a sulfa antibiotic, I would not use this because they likely will have a reaction to this as well. I did quickly want to cover your insulins. This is not going to be an in-depth video about insulin because insulin is is a lot but not a lot at the same part at the same time um i will typically start insulin on a patient whose a1c is around 9 to 10 or if i have tried a bunch of other medications they are not helpful i'm not getting an a1c response then sometimes i will go ahead and check the amount of insulin that the patient is making say that i have them on metformin say i have them on ozempic say i have them on an sglt2 all of this stuff and their a1c is still through the roof and they swear up and down that they're taking their medications it could quite possibly be that they have now used up all of their insulin production. They might now be insulin dependent, meaning that I need to replace their insulin. Um, so you can always check an insulin level in a patient who is, who is diabetic. Always keep that in the back of your mind. Now, when I'm starting an insulin, I will always start with a long acting insulin because this is a very overwhelming conversation to have with a patient, with your patient. Now you are going to be on injectables for the rest of your life. Um, because you are not producing enough insulin. So it's it's a lot to learn um, and it's a big conversation with my patients. So I will typically start with a long acting insulin. So you can think of like your Basaglar, Glargine. There's a bunch of long acting insulins and usually they are weight based on how you will start them. But I typically start at 10 units off the bat once a day and we will adjust as needed. The great thing about long acting insulin is it does not peak. So you do not get a blood sugar drop. Um, and it's the least scary thing that I can start on a patient who is going to be insulin dependent from now on. Now, after I have started that, I will usually have the patient come back starting them on a short acting insulin, meaning an insulin that they would take 15 to 30 minutes before their next meal, um, because it's going to have a high peak time. Um, so meaning it's going to peak in 30 to 60 minutes. So there is short acting insulin, there's regular insulin, and then there's obviously 70-30. I will say I've never started a patient on 70-30 insulin. I don't really plan to. If I get to that point, I will usually send them out to an endocrinologist. And a lot of times if I have patients already on insulin, um, already on oral anti-diabetic medications and their A1C is still not good, I will say you are a patient of endocrine now. I feel like I have done my best and I need their help. So that is just a brief overview on insulin. When I start somebody on short acting insulin, um, I will typically start at like a low dose sliding scale, which my practice already has a low dose sliding scale, a medium dose and a high dose, um, and kind of go from there. And if your patient is on insulin, or even if they're not on insulin and their insurance will approve it, try to get them a continuous glucose monitor. It is so helpful. Um, for the patient and for the provider to be able to know what their glucose levels are at random times of the day. So always keep that in mind. Your patient is going to need a glucose monitor if they are diabetic, um, but some insurances will only cover them if they are insulin dependent diabetic. There is one more class of diabetic medications that I did not mention, and they are called your TZDs, and they are things like pioglitazone and I think rosaglitazone, and I did not cover them because I never use them. Um, one, they're very, they are very old medication, and two, can increase your risk of heart failure. They're very hard on the heart. Um, so it should never be used if a patient has heart failure. And I personally just think we have a bunch of other options nowadays. Um, so I never, ever, ever use those. But if you are worried about a patient with cost, cost effectiveness, your three drug classes that I would pick from are going to be metformin, obviously, first off, um, sulfonylureas, which can be used as an adjunct, um, and then your TZD. I'm going to link the guidelines that I use for treating type 2 diabetes and how to pick certain medications. These are the biggest indicators that I want you to remember that we have already talked about. Now remember, first line therapy is always lifestyle modifications and metformin. Insurance is not going to jump 
to your more expensive medications if you have not tried metformin first. Whether you try it and just and fail it as in your A1C is not a goal or they cannot tolerate it due to GI upset. These are your two biggest clinical indicators for picking diabetic medications, okay? If a patient has a high ASCVD risk, remember we talked about ASCVD risk on our hypertension lecture, and that is your atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk. You can literally Google ASCVD risk, um, and there is a calculator that asks the patient's age, their gender, their race, their blood pressure, if they're on blood pressure medication, if they're on diabetic medication, if they smoke, um, and it will calculate a risk for you. So if they have a high ASCVD risk, which would be anything above 7.5% is considered high, I would go with either a GLP-1, think that starts, those are your semaglutides, your trisepatides, anything ending in tide, or your SGL2 inhibitors, which think are anything that ends in glyphosin. Um, Invocana, Farsiga, Jardiance. Um, this would be my personal first pick. These are what you're going to go to right off the bat if they have a high cardiovascular risk. Now, if they have heart failure or chronic kidney disease, you need to pick an SGLT2. Um, those are, like I talked about, amazing for your cardiovascular and your renal risk. If somebody does not have those clinical indicators, so they don't have a high ASCVD risk, they don't have um, chronic kidney disease, then you can really think about what is going to be best for your patient. Again, we've talked about cost a hundred times by now, but if you're really worried about cost, your patient doesn't have insurance, I would go for metformin and or and a sulfonylurea if you need to use two. Again, you need to use your clinical judgment when you're talking about how many medications to start. And I would really urge you to start one um, at a time and bring them back with some glucose levels so that you can figure out what you need to do from there. If you are really focused on weight and weight loss, your, your SGL, your DPP-4s, your GLP-1s, those are really good for weight loss. Um, and a lot of times, a lot of your diabetics could benefit from weight loss, but not all of them. Now, when you're checking an A1C, an A1C is a three month measurement of your blood sugar. So you should check it every three months. Now, a lot of those medications, especially the GLP ones are titratable medications, meaning you start at a low dose and every four weeks you would titrate the dose up as tolerated. Um, so that's a good reason to see your patient back once a month to make sure that they are tolerating it okay and not having hypoglycemic episodes um, and you can increase the medication if necessary. So that is a very, very broad overview of type two diabetes diagnosis management. I feel like I don't talk about it a lot, but I wrote this book essentially in NP school, which was all of my notes um, in class and I used it throughout my clinicals and you can just kind of see, I wanted to give you guys a little overview of it. I do sell this on Etsy um, and I bring it to work with me because if I ever need to reference something, I have algorithms in here. I have the COPD treatment algorithm. Um, I have different types of inhalers. I have blood pressure treatment. I have your, your non-dihydropyridines versus your dihydropyridines when to avoid using both. And for me, it's just a great reference rather than having to go to up to date all the time and filtering through 101 articles. Um, so I do sell this on Etsy. If you want to get your hands on it, you can buy it through there. I think it's like 50 bucks. There are a lot of acronyms in here. That is, as you guys can probably tell, just because it's easier to write and to take notes in acronyms. So if you find acronyms hard to follow, this is probably not for you. I do have a key in the beginning of all of the acronyms that I use um, because they might not be common acronyms, but yeah, I'll have that linked below as well as some resources, the algorithm that I referenced so that you guys can see what I'm talking about. And I hope you guys enjoyed that. Yeah, I hope that helps you guys. And let me know what the next diagnosis and treatment video that you guys want me to do. I'm really thinking I'll probably do about one a month because to be honest, this is a ton of work and takes up most of my day. And you guys know I don't have a ton of time. So um, it takes me a little while to prepare and to kind of like go over what I wanna talk about, the high points that I wanna hit. So let me know what you guys want me to address next and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye guys.